Identifying the wrecks of submarines is notoriously difficult. This is particularly true for those from the First World War. They were built in large numbers and information on their fate is often hard to find. Usually you can tell what type of submarine it is by looking at the size and then other features such as the number of guns, number of torpedo tubes and location of hatches. Actually identifying the specific submarine can be much more challenging though. Normally the only place it's possible to find a serial number is on the propellers. The propellers are often covered with over a hundred years of marine concretion. Removing it in order to read the numbers can be physically demanding and time-consuming work that is made worse when done at any sort of depth. This video is taken from the second dive that we did on a First World War German submarine. From the first dive, we know that it's a UC Type 2 mine laying submarine. The Germans built 64 of these and they're widely recognised as the most successful submarine design in history. According to modern estimates, they sank more than 1,800 enemy vessels. 46 of the 64 built were lost during the First World War and there are four serious contenders for the identity of the one that we're about to dive on. It's located approximately 40 miles offshore and in 85 metres of water, so getting to it is really challenging and the dives were two years apart. I've put a link in the comments section if you want to see the video from the first dive. A key observation though was that the port propeller was, was buried in the sand and so therefore was inaccessible. This left only the starboard propeller which was heavily covered in net. Even though we'd cut some of it away, the expectation was that there'd be a lot of work to do down there. Here I am on the descent with my buddy. Conditions look great. And as you can see, he's got a bag full of tools that we're gonna to use to clear and then scrub the prop. Descending to 85 meters takes a surprisingly amount of time. As you can see, the water's getting darker and we decide we need our torches to light the way. There's quite large chunks of this video where nothing very much seems to be happening. Either I'm ascending, descending, scrubbing props, moving around a wreck. I don't apologize for it. It's giving you a feel for what it's actually like to be on one of these dives. But just to let you know that there is more of this coming. It's always a great moment when you've descended down a shot line and you realise you're on the wreck. Next job is to fix our strobes to the shot line to make it easy to find it. Realistically, we probably don't need to do it on something like a submarine, but it's always nice to be able to see them and know that you've got a way home clearly marked. And there it is. It's a beautiful wreck, this one really intact. I've dived it before so I know where we are and which way to the stern. Ah. <laughs> we 
Before we do that though, I need to secure the shot line to the wreck. This just makes sure that it stays where it is and doesn't get dragged off, possibly by the tide or some of the other divers. That's what I'm going to use that bit of string for. It's known as a waster. It can be difficult to find things on submarines to tie onto. I'm in luck here as there's something sticking on the edge of the pressure hull. I've been a bit of an idiot though. That loop on the rope is designed to make it easy to attach the waster. So I've got to go back and undo the knot. Without a piece of admin complete, I can now get on with the main job of getting to the stern and seeing what condition the prop is. It's actually really close. And the first thing I notice when I get there is that loads of the net that we cut off last time has actually been moved away by the tides. This is really good news. It makes it a lot easier to get to the prop. There's three blades on the prop. And there's only going to be writing in between one set of blades. That means we need to scrub in three places. So we quickly divide up who's going to do what. The most difficult place to scrub is the place underneath. It's quite tight. That's why I've taken off one of my bailout cylinders in order to make it easier for me to get in there. pretty tight though and I smash my head off the prop not surprisingly as soon as we start scrubbing the viz disappears We're using things that look like very large, stiff Brillo pads. They're actually designed for exactly this task, i.e. removing concretion from brass propellers. Probably not used to dealing with this amount of concretion though. At this depth, this is much harder than it looks and you get fatigued really quickly. I've come out to give the other diver a go. You can see the Brillo pad there. It also means that I can take some photos.
with my video lights on, it's much easier to see what's going on. You can see one diver down there scrubbing the prop. And you can also see in the left hand side of the video, that's the remains of the rudder. Down on the seabed, next to my bailout cylinder, you can see one of the hydroplanes. It must have come off at some point, maybe when the uh, submarine sunk or possibly pulled off as a result of trawling or fishing action, who knows. That the Brillo pads aren't making much of an impression on the concretion. It's time to up the game a bit with a wire brush.
I've scrubbed other one props before and I know where the number should be. So I make sure the other diver knows to clean in the right place. We've decided that there's nothing on the two spaces that are easiest to get to. So the other diver's going to have another go underneath and see what he can uh, do there.
Really irritatingly, I've somehow managed to lose approximately four minutes of my video, which is why it suddenly leaps from me taking photos of the prop to me taking photos of the deck gun, which is actually in front of the conning tower. Worth noting though that the deck gun is pointing hard over to the port side, almost as if it's aiming at something behind it. As I continue to move towards the bow, you can see the mine shafts. They're all empty, which shows that this submarine almost certainly laid its mines somewhere else. It's also notable that there's no significant damage in the bow area. There are several instances where you see submarines laid mines and then fell victim to their own ones. This doesn't appear to have been the case with this particular submarine. This is the port torpedo tube, which is broken off from the main pressure hull and is lying on the seabed. This is the very front of the pressure hull of the submarine. You can see one of the hydroplanes on the left hand side of the screen. We're back at the gun now. You can see it's clearly pointing to the port side rear. One of my theories about how this submarine is sunk is that it was engaged in a surface battle. And I believe the position of this gun supports my theory. You can also see ready use ammunition there on the deck. The other thing that I think supports my theory about how it's sunk is that there are two large holes in the conning tower, once again on the rear port side, i.e. the same direction that the gun is pointing. I believe that the crew were engaged in a battle. 
Perhaps the battle wasn't going so well for them and they decided to withdraw. As they were withdrawing, they were hit in the conning tower in two places. And as can be seen, this would have clearly compromised the water integrity of the submarine and I believe led it to its sinking. Of course, it's equally possible that other things may have created these holes. Some other man-made event, such as bottom trawling, perhaps then enhanced by a hundred odd years of corrosion? Who knows? But something's got to explain this sub sinking, and these are the obvious contenders. The other interesting thing is there's also other holes in the pressure hull. There's an example there. And the hatch that we'll see shortly is open. The one at the front you may have seen was closed. Perhaps the crew were hit in this pressure compartment and tried to escape. Who knows? That's the hatch I was talking about. It goes into the engine room where the submarine's twin diesel engines can be found. My dive's nearly up. But before I return to the shot line, I have a quick look again at the prop where we can see there's a couple of divers still working. My bottom time is done, so it's time to ascend. I've got several hours of decompression ahead of me and plenty of time to ponder as to what the identity of this submarine might be. So the question is, what is the identity of the submarine that you've seen on this dive and that we've dived previously? And the answer is, unfortunately, we still don't know for certain. The photographs that you saw me take and that were taken by other members of the team who scrubbed the props afterwards didn't reveal any numbers or letters on the prop, which was incredibly frustrating. Trawl through German World War I archives, though, revealed that one of the candidates for the identity of this submarine, the UC-68, had problems with its props and had them changed shortly before it's lost. Therefore, our best guess is that the props that were fitted were unmarked, and therefore that's why we've not been able to see anything on them. Combined with other information, it's therefore our belief that this submarine is the missing UC-68.
I hope you've enjoyed my video and found it interesting, even if you probably share my frustration that we haven't been able to come to a conclusive result. Please like and share and comment and subscribe. Also, don't forget I've got loads of other videos of deep dives similar to this one, and I'll hope you take the time to have a look at some of those as well. In the meantime, I've got another hour or two of decompression to do.